Okay, um, this is the first lecture of the course and also the first lecture about um, the base of the food chain, uh, about the phytoplankton that are carrying out um, prime production. So this will be the first of about two and a half, three, depending on how you count it, on these, this very important part of, of the oceans. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today and for the next uh, couple of lectures um, is pretty much all summarized in the readings that are indicated here. Um, no, you don't need to read these in order to answer a specific question on the test. I'm not going to go to the readings and take um, anything that's not covered in these lectures. But um, I encourage you to look at these chapters and these books um, to get um, you know a different slant or a different uh, version of what I'm going to talk about today and the next couple of lectures. Okay, so let's start off with the real basics. What is prime production? You probably know this already. It's the first step in the food chain, hence the name primary. Production, of course, means the synthesis of biomass, cellular material, the proteins, polysaccharides, and so on that make up these organisms. Um, and this type of uh, synthesis um, is, of course, based on carbon dioxide. Um, all that organic material in well, the whole biosphere comes from prime producers. Um, that make organic material by this fixation of CO2. And because of the source of the organic material is CO2, we call this form of, 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 of metabolism autotrophy. Auto meaning self, trophy meaning food. So they're making their own uh, carbon, basically. And the, uh, the ecological process is prime production. The physiological process is photosynthesis. Um, there's one or two examples of prime production that's not carried out by photosynthesis that we'll actually uh, see much later in the course. And uh, in the whole biosphere, it's of course the plants and the algae the, that are carrying out this photosynthesis. Um, and these are the photoautotrophs, to use the, the two uh, phrases or the two uh, syllables. Photo meaning, of course, the energy comes from light. Autotrophin meaning that these organisms fix CO2. So in this course, uh, we'll be focusing mainly, mainly on phytoplankton algae, and we'll have a, a few things to say about the higher plants that we see um, on the, uh, uh, in the oceans. So phytoplankton, um, of course, support the, almost entirely the, uh, uh, are entirely responsible for the marine food web that we see in the oceans. Um, that, that, that's another way of saying that most of prime production is carried out by these free-floating organisms. Um, the, uh, we can call these algae, but there are some algae that are not free-floating, that are not phytoplankton. But uh, for the most part, all of prime production in the ocean is done by phytoplankton. So everything you see there is based on extremely, for the most part, extremely small organisms, generally organisms that you cannot see without the help of a microscope. Um, they range in size from, from some, some, some cyanobacteria that are even less than one micron in size to things that are tens of microns in size, 100 or so microns in length. Um, and these very small organisms, of course, are the ones that are supporting the growth eventually, not directly, but via the food chain, very large organisms that, that range up to hundreds of meters in, in size. So we see this huge range of, of size in the oceans, ranging from organisms down to a micron, or 10 to the minus 6 meters, all the way up to 10 to the 2 meters, 100 uh, or so meters. Eight orders of magnitude um, change in differences in the phytoplankton, in, in the organisms that we see in the oceans. So even this biggest, the organisms that we see, the charismatic megafauna, are based on these really small organisms that are about a micron in size. And that has really important character uh, uh, implications for how things are structured and set um, in the oceans. And we talked a little bit about that already last time, about how um, on land uh, the prime producers are very big, have cellulose, um, versus the small phytoplankton in the ocean are basically very protein rich. So we'll, we'll be going over some of the, the important characteristics of these phytoplanktons. Phytoplankton, talking about their growth rates, already talked about their size. It turns out size really matters a lot in the oceans. Um, how big you are to, to per, determines how big of prey you can um, ingest and how big of a predator uh, may be eating you. Uh, talk a little bit about shape and a little bit about chemical composition of these organisms. 
So over the next uh, today and the next couple lectures, we're going to be talking, of course, what, a little bit about what prime production is. We've kind of gone over that already. Um, talk a little bit more about the details of uh, photosynthesis, um, in particular about how light is used by these organisms, and the term that's used by people studying this, um, uh, this, this process is harvesting. Light is harvested by these algae or phytoplankton. And then we'll also today um, talk about the uh, types of uh, phytoplankton that we see in the oceans. And then we'll start to talk a little bit about what controls their, their rates of production. Okay, so photosynthesis, hopefully that this is a review for you. Um, you know that it's a fixation of CO2 to organic material with the help of water. Water is really important um, um, in this reaction, not only as a media for these organisms to grow in, but water is a source of electrons that eventually make its way to oxygen. And so it's the reaction that changed the, the Earth because of of, uh, well, for two things. First of all, it <coughs> provides organic carbon that supports all the other organisms on the planet, including us. Um, but secondly, it produces oxygen. And so this type of photosynthesis, there are other types that do not pr produce oxygen, but this type of photosynthesis is producing oxygen, which has a huge, huge, huge impact on the geochemistry of the, ocean, of the, of the planet, not just the ocean, but the entire planet. So it really changed um, uh, what the planet looked like. Okay, so um, I, again, this is kind of a review, but it's important that we go over that photosynthesis consists of two um, parts, the so-called light reaction, obviously because it depends on light, um, and that involves the splitting of water um, and producing oxygen. That water yields two electrons that goes on to um, the dark reaction, um, and, and it's a dark reaction, not so much that it's inhibited by light, but it simply does not involve light directly. And that's a reaction that fixes CO2 um, and produces the organic material. In this course, I'll often use um, CH2O um, as a shorthand for talking about organic material. Um, it's just a little bit easier to write out um, than, than any other formula that I could write there. It, it's not really representing a particular compound, but again, it's just a, um, a general shorthand for organic material, uh, nondescript organic material. And so, um, as I said, the, the you know, water is crucial for this. Water is crucial because it's providing the electrons um, uh, that eventually go on to the fixation of CO2. And what's happening here is that the, the carbon and carbon dioxide is being reduced to the oxidation that we st state that we see in the organic material, um, and those electrons come from water, and they have the uh, very good byproduct, good for us, us aerobic oxygen breathing organisms, of producing oxygen that we of course need. So, source of the energy for the pho for photosynthesis? Well, the answer is right there. If you didn't know it already, it's of course sunlight it's it's the uh, it's light it's sun um, and so the question now becomes how are these these organisms um, uh, we're focusing on phytoplankton but really the answer is for all plants in the biosphere how is this light energy harvested how is it obtained um, by these organisms and and the the part of the answer important part of the answer is chlorophyll a um, chlorophyll a um, is present in all these organisms um, but they differ in other pigments. Um, so in all organisms, in all plants or in phytoplankton, basically we see this type of very simple uh, di this is a very simple diagram su summarized in photosynthesis. So basically the light reaction is a, is a um, membrane dependent process that involves the, the uh, absorption of light by um, chlorophyll A but also these other pigments that are sometimes called accessory pigments. Um, and this energy then goes on to make ATP um, and NAD8, NDPH, the reducing power, that, that's where the electrons are, 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 are carried. Um, and that, those electrons are, again, are crucial, um, essential for the reduction of CO2 down to the uh, oxidation state of carbon and organic material. 
So that's in, in a very, really simple diagram of what photosynthesis is all about. And the, the uh, pathway that carries out that CO2 fixation is called the Calvin Benson Bachelm cycle, uh, sometimes just called the Calvin cycle, although it's all three um, guys should get credit for coming up with this. Uh, Calvin and Benson um, got the uh, Nobel Prize for figuring this out, and I think Basham was uh, a little bit screwed on this and didn't get it. Anyway, um, that's the reaction um, that carries out CO2 fixation. So the crucial thing here that we're focusing on, though, is not the dark reaction, but the light reaction. And the absorption of that light energy by, um, by first of all, chlorophyll A, but also the accessory pigments. So all these organisms have chlorophyll A because it's chlorophyll A that's involved in the reaction center that's translating this light energy into chemical energy. So that's worthwhile saying again, light energy um, into chemical energy. Not coming out real clearly, but I hope you can see it. Um, light energy into chemical energy. That's really done by chlorophyll A. And the accessory pigments uh, transfer that um, still, in a sense, light energy to chlorophyll A that does all the heavy lifting in terms of, of translating it to chemical energy that we see in ATP. So, um, so we use chlorophyll A because it's found in all these organisms as a measure of biomass of these organisms. It's, it's a crude measure of biomass. Um, maybe index would be a better word because many um, oceanographers are not um, comfortable with actually translating into grams of carbon. They'll just keep it um, as expressed as of chlorophyll A. But the point is, is you know, very simply, if you have more chlorophyll A, you have more phytoplankton biomass. The other pigments are also of use, not as um, not used as, as commonly, but are of use in to determine which phytoplankton are present. These other pigments, the accessory pigments, um, differ among the different types of phytoplankton. So if you know which accessory pigment is present, you have some idea about what types of phytoplankton are, are in your water sample. And so here are just a few of the organisms and some of the pigments. You can see here some of the organisms. We're going to see more about these in a minute. Um, uh, diatoms have chlorophyll A. Uh, Fucoxanthin is also present in diatoms and so on. Uh, no, I don't think it's really essential that you remember these details, about which pigments occur in which organisms, but I definitely want you to remember that these phytoplankton differ in the types of pigments that they have. They, again, they all have chlorophyll A, they all have chlorophyll A, but they don't, it's not writing real well, is it? So this new screen, I'm just playing with this new, new computer, a lot faster, but the screen is not, um, maybe I just, sometimes my finger uses, works better. Anyway, um, all these organisms have chlorophyll A, but um, they differ in these other pigments. They all have chlorophyll A because it's that pigment that's involved in the reaction center. Um, so the question is, um, uh, well, uh, uh, it's an observation first. The observation is that land plants are always green, as indicated right there in that little picture there. Um, whereas if you look at these phytoplankton, um, they're not necessarily all green. Um, they come in these different colors. Um, and the answer is, um, uh, is because that all land plants have chlorophyll A, as do these phytoplankton. They all have chlorophyll A too. Land plants have chlorophyll B, but the other, um, the phytoplankton that we see in the oceans, and especially in the ocean, but also to lesser extent in fresh waters, they have these other accessory pigments. And in fact, in these, um, in the phytoplankton that we see in the oceans, the, the concentration of the other accessory pigments are, is much higher than chlorophyll A. And so they're not green necessarily. They're, they're in fact sometimes brown. And my favorite is a type of cyan bacteria that's a blood red because it has a high, high amounts of uh, pigment called phycoerythrin. Um, so they're not green at all. And it's because they have these um, really high concentrations of these other um, accessory pigments. So then the question is, um, why is that? Why do these other uh, why do the phytoplankton have these other pigments, whereas um, land plants don't? And the answer is um, because of the attenuation of light. And the attenuation of light is basically um, a fancy way of saying that the dimming of light, the cutting off of, of, of light as it goes through the water column. And it's not that just 
light, all light um, goes uh, is cut down as it goes to uh, the water column. It's that the attenuation varies with depth. And so basically the color of the light as it goes to the water column uh, varies with, with, with uh, depth. And basically this happens at both um, ends of the spectrum. Both the, the short and the long wavelengths are cut off, attenuated. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. So first of all, let's look at what happens with total light, and actually any wavelength of light. Um, and this is a, one of the uh, few equations I'm going to ask you to remember, how light um, uh, is attenuated or decreases with depth. It basically is an exponential process. And so the equation basically says you take light at the surface of the, of the water column here, um, and, and you look at through the water column, and, and depth um, is always represented as z, or, or you know, better is actually to write it out as depth, um, on the y-axis. A little bit, this is kind of typical of, of oceanography, is to have depth on the vertical axis and the other parameter that you're measuring on the horizontal axis, and, and the units are up here. It's pretty typical for these types of graphs, and we're going to be seeing these on and off throughout the course. Anyway, so at the surface, we have the light is at its brightest, of course, and that's re represented as I sub zero, where um, you know the zero indicates, of course, that the depth is equal to zero, um, and then that decreases exponentially, as indicated there, where K is the attenuation co coefficient. So basically, um, it's a uh, kind of a very simple equation to describe how light decreases exponentially with depth. And the, and the thing is, is that that k varies, that k varies with the wavelength. That attenuation varies with the wavelength. It, it takes on different um, uh, values depending on the wavelength of the light. And that's illustrated here, or at least the attenuation of light um, as a function of wavelength is it illustrated in this graph. So what you're looking at here is the wavelength of light, uh, basically for the light that can be used by photos photosynthesis, roughly from 400 to 700 nanometers. And this is the, the, the intensity of that light. And the graph is normalized such that the intensity is, is uh, the same at you know, roughly, well, exactly at 570 nanometers. And, and the advantage of that is that now you can see how the um, how the ends of the of the of the spectrum of light is is cut down um, at both the the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, lower wavelengths and the uh, higher wavelengths. So again, if we if we were to uh, graph this on the absolute scale. Uh, the total intensity of the light decreases as you go down through the water. But the point here is that not only does the total intensity decrease, but also the, uh, uh, the, the light at the either ends also decrease much more so than what we see in the, in the middle of the spectrum. So that's what you see here. So here's, a, here's the uh, spectrum at the surface. Uh, even, at this, even at the surface, you know, I guess it would be a couple millimeters below the surface. We see some attenuation already. So this is um, already a little bit below one. Even down one below one meter, again we see even more attenuation. That is, there's more light that's being absorbed by the water. For the most part, this is by the water um, at either ends of the spectrum. And then finally we get down to 13 meters, really not all that deep. Um, we can see that there's hardly any light um, here at the very low wavelengths nor at the very high wavelengths. Um, uh, and so I know from looking at this that this is probably fairly turbid coastal waters um, um, because this is happening over only 13 meters um, in, the, in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean, which is really, really clear water, very oligotrophic water, very nutrient poor waters. Um, this probably would take many uh, more meters before we'd see this type of attenuation. So, uh, so this is from turbid, uh, fairly turbid waters. But anyway, the point is again is that you see this this cutting off of the of the light at both the low wavelengths and the high wavelengths. Now you can start to see that why these organisms have evolved and come up with these different pigments to deal with this problem. Here is absorption of chlorophyll through here, um, and and you can see that chlorophyll doesn't absorb 
so well right in the middle here of the spectrum where um, uh, where there's most of the light um, relative to to the whole spectrum so that's basically why these organisms have to have other pigments besides just chlorophyll and so here again is the absor absorption of chlorophyll which is present in all these organisms all these organisms have to have it in order to carry out photosynthesis it's the it's the pigment in the reaction center now I'm drawing this with my finger so that's why it looks a little weird it, all these organisms have chlorophyll A because it's in a reaction center but because of the attenuation of the light at the precisely where chlorophyll A is, absorbs the most uh, we need to have uh, these organisms need to have other pigments um, in order to absorb in the middle of the, of the spectrum and one example is phycoerythrin and there are other examples with uh, other carotenoids that absorb uh, outside of the, uh, the regions where chlorophyll A absorbs. So basically that's why these, these phytoplankton have different pigments. It's in or, order to absorb light that's actually present in the oceans. Now we don't need to get into much of the chemistry of these different pigments but suffice it to say that they differ rather subtly. Um, I was a little impressed by this. Um, they often differ by just one substitution, one methyl group. Uh, this is basically chlorophyll A, but so all these other pigments differ very subtly um, uh, in, in their different uh, groups there. Okay, so you know now, of course, that prime production is a synthesis of biomass. You know, we, I, I've used C2, CH2O to represent that organic material that's in that biomass it produces oxygen. Um, you now know that light energy is harvested by chlorophyll A um, and all organisms have chlorophyll A because it's in the reaction center but but the marine organisms, the marine phytoplankton, also have to have other pigments. Um, in fact most of the light harvesting is done by these other pigments, not chlorophyll A. Um, and, that's, and they need these other pigments because of the changes in the light availability, not only the total amount of light, but the quality. And quality here basically means the, the wavelength um, of the light um, varies yeah, varies with, uh, with the depth. Um, and as you go down deeper and deeper in the water calm, you can see this, this, this attenuation um, where the both the low and high wavelengths are are cut off by the uh, by the water by absorption of the water, and so because of that attenuation, they need to have these other pigments to to get enough light energy to survive and grow. So that variation in response to light is one reason, but there are many other reasons why we have lots of different types of phytoplankton in the ocean. So what I'm going to do now is give a little bit of overview of some of these organisms and, and highlight some of the big, uh, big ones, big in terms of importance, um, that we see um, in marine systems. So I, I think it's worthwhile looking at them because they're so pretty. I hope you agree that they're really kind of cool looking, um, ranging from, you can see the Cucolithophorids there, and these are various types of diatoms for the most part there. So they are diverse in appearance and also in their evolution. And so what you're looking at here is a uh, phylogenetic tree of, of all eukaryotes, all uh, organisms that have nucleus. Um, and uh, uh, the, the circles that just popped up on the screen there are the phytoplankton. And uh, the point here is that um, these phytoplankton um, have evolved uh, separately several times during the course of it, the evolution. It's not as if they all come from one single ancestor. So the fancy way of saying that is polyphyletic. So they've come from different, uh, several sources. Um, and, and so they're really diverse. And so if you look at just the land plants, they're really kind of born in terms of their evolution. They're just from one branch of that tree of life. And, and most of the organisms uh, uh, and land animals are similarly pretty diverse, uh, pretty boring. There's all the land animals, including us, are down over there. And all these other organisms are representative of multitude of different types of microbes that we see, um, not only in the oceans, um, but also uh, on land as well. And we're going to get into some of these uh, later on um, as we go through the course. But 
Um, the point here is that the different types of phytoplankton that we see um, in the oceans are really evolutionary, phy phylogenetically, taxonomically quite diverse. And um, uh, having said that, though, um, and, and, and they do come from different origins. I don't want to give the impression that they come from one single ancestor. But it is true that there is one theory that basically describes their evolution. And, and I, I hope you've seen, heard about this before. We're not going to uh, spend too much time on it, but I, I, I thought it was worthwhile to, to have one slide on, a, on the endosymbiotic theory for the evolution of, the, of eukaryotic algae. Um, and basically, um, the, 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 uh, the theory starts off with, with the um, back about, ooh, about uh, three billion years ago, um, uh, there are already uh, heterotrophic eukaryotes. Heterotrophic, of course, um, are the carbon oxidizing organisms like our cells, which had the mitochondria. That's a mitochondria there. And this theory um, and this diagram is about the evolution of the eukaryotic phytoplankton or eukaryotic algae, eventually leading to higher plants. And the um, main event that led to the um, evolution of these eukaryotic algae and higher plants is the engulfing of a cyanobacterium. A cyanobacterium is a type of, of, of blue-green algae. It's another name, old name for, for these uh, cyanobacteria. That's a, it's a bacterium. Um, it does not have a nucleus. It's a prokaryote. But it's able to carry out photosynthesis just like the um, like the eukaryotic, eukaryotic um, uh, algae and higher plants. And that cyanobacteria was engulfed um, by that heterotrophic eukaryote, but instead of being eaten, which it had been for billions of years prior to this one fateful day, it was kept as a slave, basically. And over time, it resulted in the phytoplankton that we see today. Um, and there are other events that happened that gave rise to different types of phytoplankton, different types of algae in higher plants. But the point here I want to emphasize is the, is the fact that, um, and there's lots of evidence so we don't have time to get into, to indicate that this, uh, the chloroplasts that we see in eukaryotic um, uh, algae in higher plants are basically captured cyanobacteria that once were free-living cyanobacteria, but that were engulfed by this heterotrophic eukaryote um, and, and were kept as slaves and were put to work as chloroplasts uh, for these organisms. And that's how we got these different, many different types of uh, phytoplankton that we see in the oceans and higher plants on land. Okay, so, um, but back to the ecology. Um, uh, you know already um, that the phytoplankton are, are crucial for supporting almost the entire marine food chain. The almost is because there are some um, places like salt marshes and mangroves where um, higher plants, rooted um, algae, um, and so on are the main prime producers. But for the most part in the oceans, it's the phytoplankton that are, uh, are supporting everything else that we see in, in the seawater. And they support um, the next trophic level up um, is the copepods, and we're going to be talking about copepods in a couple of weeks. They're the main grazers um, uh, in the oceans, or important grazers, and they're part of the zooplankton community. Um, and of course, uh, those uh, copepods are eaten by fish, secondary community uh, uh, com consumers, um, and those fish in turn are eaten by um, whales and sharks and so on, and then perhaps eventually. The top predator in the food chain, that is us. Okay, so um, I said this already, but it's worthwhile repeating that in addition to producing organic material that's used by the food chain, um, this, this metabolism um, produces a really important waste product. Um, and that waste product, of course, is oxygen. Um, you may know about oxygen. That's something that you're breathing right now. I, I hope you're breathing. Um, just not asleep and snoring. Um, anyway, it's obviously important to um, the development of, of the and the evolution of higher organisms on land and as well as in the ocean. And in fact, phytoplankton themselves um, and the oceanic phytoplankton 
are really important um, in terms of producing oxygen. They produce about half of all the oxygen on the planet. So for every other breath, uh, thank a, a, a phytoplankton in the ocean for supplying that oxygen. Um, that's another way of saying that about, about half of all prime produ production on the, in the biosphere is by phytoplankton in the ocean. And the other half is by higher uh, terrestrial plants. So you know already, phytoplankton are very diverse, different sizes, different shapes. And so um, let's talk a little bit about that diversity and get into a few types of phytoplankton that we see. And so one way they organize um, those, those phytoplankton is by um, what's called functional groups. It's basically what these organisms are doing. Um, and, and rather than trying to follow some phylogenetic uh, grouping or, or some other way of putting these, uh, making sense of these organisms. Let's follow what they do and in, in some of the more important aspects of, of, their, uh, of their biology. So the first one we have to talk about is, are the diatoms. Diatoms are real important in, in blooms in, in seawater and ocean waters. And what makes them really different, I'm going to go through these um, in more detail in a minute. Um, so you don't have to um, think, uh, take this all in right now. Um, uh, what makes them really different is the fact that they have silicate. They have basically glass um, as for their cell walls. Another important, uh, another important group are the catholithophorids. Um, instead of glass, they have cement. They have calcium carbonate in their cell walls. Uh, fourth group we're not going to say too much more about are, is uh, phaeocystis. Uh, third, did I say fourth? I, I meant the third. The third group is phaeocystis. That's a genus of algae. Um, they produce a compound called DMS, dimethyl sulfide. Um, that turns out to be important in cloud formation. Um, and there's a whole theory uh, based on by, uh, 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 called the, the Gaia hypothesis. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that really fascinating connection between the biology of the oceans and our climate uh, via uh, this gas, dimethyl sulfide, um, and, and the formation of clouds. The fourth group um, are those organisms that are carrying out um, nitrogen fixation. Um, those are, are, are all bacteria, only bacteria are able to do that. And the most important group, or a important group, are the cyanobacteria. Uh, we talked about those already. Those are the blue-green algae. They're real important in terms of fixing um, nitrogen and making um, uh, a form of fixed nitrogen ammonium from that. And then finally, we have the small organisms, the picophytoplankton. We're going to talk uh, more about different ways of sizing organisms and different classifications based on size. The pico is the smallest. It's basically less than a micron in size. Um, and these often dominate in um, in the open ocean, far from land, where nutrients are really, really low. So we call these oligotrophic um, uh, uh, regions. And in those regions, it's the picophytoplankton that dominate the, the phytoplankton community. So let's talk a little bit more about diatoms. They're really cool. As I said, they have glass for their cell walls. Or frustules is the word that's used to describe their cell wall. It's, uh, it's made of uh, silicon dioxide, basically the, the main ingredient of glass. The, uh, the, the geologists like um, uh, uh, diatoms because they, um, they, uh, their, their cell walls are, are, are uh, preserved in sediments and they can look at that. Um, and they'll, me they'll measure um, biogenic uh, 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 silicate or opal is the uh, term that they all use to describe this compound. But anyway, what you should remember is, for, first of all, that diatoms are real important in spring bloom. And they have these cell walls that are made of, of silicon dioxide, basically uh, 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 the, the main ingredient of glass. So there's some more pictures of them, kind of a little bit more sterile uh, black and white pictures. But I guess what's important to note here is that they come in colonies, several cells linked together. Um, different shapes, different spines. The, the spines are thought to, to ward off grazers. Um, I think it's, I hope it's clear that, or at least I wouldn't want to eat something that's so uh, prickly like that. Um, uh, they can be real long, uh, many cells in, in, in diameter, um, in, in, uh, hooked together. And, they, and the, sh the cells, them cells themselves can be different shapes as illustrated there. 
Um, just another picture of a diatom. Um, so their cell wall, as I've said already, there's it's a, made of silicate or silica, and it has these pores inside the frustules. You, you know, those totally pure, you know, solid glass. You know, that would the cell would not survive very long at all. Um, but in fact, it has these pores within the frustule, and it's it, you know, it's it's something that this organisms are able to make fairly easily, but it's actually really difficult for us to make um, uh, uh, in comparison. Those are diatoms. So there's there's pinnates. Those are pinnates there. It has these cigar type shapes. The centrics are, are the kind of, as you can guess, are the, are the uh, pillbox type of shapes. Um, for the most part, they divide asexually, uh, but they do have a sexual uh, phase. Um, and they're really abundant, especially in um, uh, in coastal waters and also in polar. I'm gonna I'm gonna cross out and just coastal here because they're not as important in the um, in uh, in the middle of the oceans, but they're more important important near the coast. And they're also important um, uh, at either ends of the earth and at the poles. And as I mentioned already, they do come um, as chains. Okay, another important group is the Cuthcolithophore. What makes them very interesting, what the, why the geologists like them, is that their shell is also um, pre preserved in sediments because it's made of basically cement, calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is, we'll come across and talk more about calcium carbonate when we talk about corals um, because that's the main um, um, ingredient of the coral outer skeleton. Um, but unlike corals, these coccolithophores have these really cool plates in different types of structures sticking off of, of its or of its about little body. So, of course, the organism itself is rather small, 20 microns in size or so, but they can form these large blooms, a term that we use to describe just high concentrations of these organisms. Um, and that uh, because of the um, of the calcium carbonate. Um, they can they have this more milky white uh, color to give the uh, the water a more milky white color and that can be seen by satellites from space and there's a bloom of these organisms off of Ireland and here's another one off of uh, Alaska you can see here's the Aleutian Islands and there's Alaska here um, and there's the, the Kakalotha Ford bloom that's occurring in the Bering Sea so as I said they're each one of these cells, of course, is small, 20 microns, um, not as small as a pico phytoplankton, which are, you know, the picos are less than one micron, um, but they're pretty small. Um, again, these calcium carbonate plates are, co are called coccoliths, and they are, because they are calcium inorganic, um, they are preserved in, in the sediments, and that makes them a real um, uh, uh, favorite of, of geologists who want to look at the variation of prime production over geological time scales. And you can see here they come in various shapes and this is a kind of classic picture of the coccolith, this kind of plate-like structure um, on the outside of this organism. Um, and you can see where they're found. Basically not in the tropics. They, uh, you know, I already showed you a picture of them uh, off of uh, Alaska, so they're a little bit north, more north than just the temperate seas, but they're certainly not found in the tropics. And then um, the final group of organisms that we're going to be talking about today are the dinoflagellates. Um, pretty cool, uh, really diverse uh, group of organisms. Um, they're found, they can be found in the tropics. Um, some of them have this thicate, which is a fancy word to describe these cellulose. This is um, their, their outer uh, cell wall is made of cellulose, which is the same compound that's found in higher plants, of course. They can also come naked. Uh, that is, they don't have any um, outer covering at all. And this is kind of the classic shape of a, of a dinoflagellate. Um, it has this uh, flagella, two flagella kind of sticking off of it. Um, and so those flagella, of course, are for driving the, the cell through the water for um, mobility. So many are also heterotrophic. Um, so by that, um, you know, we, we're talking about phytoplankton, and the, and which are autotrophic, that is, they make their own food from the fixation of CO2. Um, many of these uh, dinoflagellates are also capable of grazing and eating other um, microbes. Um, that is, they're heterotrophic. 
and that's one thing that's um, that's changed over the years that we've become to appreciate that these organisms are not just you know photoautotrophs or only just heterotrophs they can do a little bit of both and it makes them um, hard to study but also really fascinating to study as well another um, less cool part of them um, I guess depending on your uh, perspective is that many of them are toxic or some of them are at least are toxic and they form some uh, red tides and one of the kind of common toxins that these organisms make is called saxitoxins. So when you hear about red tides, for the most part, those are by a type of dinoflagellate. Not all dinoflagellates make red tides, but the red tides that we do see are often um, from these types of organisms. Um, and finally, what's also really cool um, is that some of them um, are bioluminescent. That is, they make light, they glow in the dark, um, and, and they're really cool because of that. Okay, so here's just some more pictures of dinoflagellates. It's lost its flagella. This is the kind of girdle that uh, sticks between the two, th the, the two halves of the theca here. And these, again, are made of uh, cellulose. Um, so I would say this is kind of what, at least what most of us think about dinoflagellates, something like this. Uh, but there are some other weirder shapes for dinoflagellates um, that don't follow that body plan. Um, they're a, kind of a weird group of organisms for many reasons. Um, as I said, these organisms can form massive uh, blooms, um, and this is, of course, an example of a red tide type of bloom, where the color you can see, you can see the boat here, um, and you can get the scale of this bloom. Um, here's just another picture of, of a red tide. can't remember where this is. Um, and this one is off of the coast of, of Japan. And so, of course, some, some of these organisms um, produce these toxins, and um, it's rather harmful to marine organisms, but also, of course, it's harmful to us. Um, and it's one of several reasons why you cannot eat shellfish during certain um, months and times of the year because of the presence of these organisms in the water that are, are, are you know, are home to the shellfish that we want to eat and are filtering out these organisms and keeping their toxins and, and when we eat them of course it's not good for us.